You're listening to Saturday Morning Media. And now, back to our show. The Cauldron of Hate, a story by Grant Pachoco. Weeds, a Cauldron of Hate story by Grant Pachoco. Note, the events in this story take place before the events in The Cauldron of Hate. Arthur P. Peterson turned off his computer for the night. Placing his hands on the desk, he took a big, deep breath in and out. He stood from his chair, admiring the view from his 45th floor office window. After pushing in his chair, he picked up his jacket, and as he put it on, he looked back out the window and saw that the view he had seen seconds before was completely gone. Replacing the view was a wall of ivy that had apparently grown over the window in seconds. Staring at it, perplexed, Arthur took a step backwards. It was just then when the ivy started to part, and appearing before him sitting in a throne of ivy was the plant lady. Arthur was frozen. The plant lady, however, snapped her fingers, and the ivy started creeping its way through cracks along the edge of the window. In a matter of moments, the window began to crack under the strain of being pulled by the ivy. The wind from being up so high flooded into the room. Arthur took a few more steps backwards until he was standing flush against the wall of his office. The window now gone, the ivy began creeping into the office. It began wrapping itself around chairs and even the desk to grab a firm hold. Arthur began whimpering as the vines reached his feet, and he looked forwards and the plant lady was now standing in the middle of his office. Arthur P. Peterson, she said, it's nice to see you. I assume you know who I am and why I am here. You're the plant lady, Arthur stammered. Yes, she replied, and I ask again, do you know why I am here? Arthur shook his head no. You are the CEO of the Sao Chemical Corporation, the corporation responsible for creating Chimera D, the deadliest weed killer in the world, a weed killer so powerful it not only kills weeds, but poisons the plants you were trying to save. Arthur put his hands up in surrender. Well, that's not true. Uh, all our tests have shown that it only kills weeds. Rage flashed across the plant lady's face as she took a step towards Arthur and the ivy in the room crept even closer to the CEO. That's not true. Your tests may have said that, but I can talk to the plants, and I'm telling you, it poisons the other plants. The ivy began slithering up Arthur's legs, and he realized it was now holding him in place. He tried to pull the vines off his legs, but two more vines lashed quickly around his wrists and pulled his arms away and out to the side. He continued to struggle, but the vines bound him so tight, movement was becoming harder and harder. His breath was now ragged as he strained against the pull of the plants. The plant lady was now directly in front of him. She was shorter than he was, but he was suddenly terrified of her, his heart attempting to leap from his chest. Arthur stammered. It's, it's harmless, I swear, the plant lady smiled. Harmless, you say? Well, then I suppose you'd have no problem with me bringing a canister of it into this very office, would you? What? Arthur whispered. Instead of replying, the plant lady snapped her fingers. Over the top of her head, Arthur could see the ivory covering the now non-existent window, parting as some of the vines brought a large 50-gallon drum into the office. Arthur's mind reeled at how the plants were able to get it so high up the side of the building, but that thought quickly faded as the plants brought the drum closer to where the two of them were standing at the back of the office. The plant lady looked at the drum as it was gingerly set down, and then back at Arthur, whose eyes were wide, staring in horror at the drum. Well, look, Arthur said, sweat running down his face. You, you, uh, you can't open that in here. It will, uh, it will, uh... It will what, dear? The plant lady said sweetly. Kill you? Arthur knew she was right. Opening that drum would kill them both. Chimera D was deadly for humans to even be around. It was created in a lab accident that killed ten technicians. Specially trained technicians had been able to find a way to contain it, replicate it, and dilute it to sell to industrial farms. But this one 50-gallon drum could kill them instantly if the lid was removed. 
Arthur tried not to show any of this on his face, but instead he tried to play on her sympathies. No, uh, it will kill these plants, he stammered. If you open that in here, your, your plants, uh, the, the ivy, will die. The plant lady's smile faded. I know that, dear. I know that all too well. But this ivy isn't going to be here when it is opened. Arthur looked at her quizzically. What? No, you see, I've got a very special plant that will open the lid for me. A plant that has been dying to meet you. Again, she snapped her fingers, and the ivy at the window pane parted. Through the separation in the ivy climbed about thirty stalks of corn. At least they resembled corn, vaguely. They were wilted, brown, and a strange, thick brown liquid dripped from the husk around each ear of corn. It slowly entered the office, slowly making its way over to where they stood. This, Mr. Peterson, is what Clymera D does to corn, the plant lady whispered. A generation ago, these were healthy corn stalks. These are just one year removed from the use of Clymera D. Arthur was visibly shaking now as the plant lady stepped back and several stalks of corn pressed right up against Arthur. She continued, Do you know that plants can feel pain, Mr. Peterson? They can. And these poor creatures can do nothing now but feel pain. From the moment their seeds sprouted, they have known nothing but pain. From the moment they were born, they were screaming in agony, and all because of Clymera D. They are dying, Mr. Peterson. They are dying, and they are going to die with you. Still think your weed killer is harmless? If it does this to the corn, what will it do to the people who eat the corn? For a brief moment, Arthur could feel the ivy around his wrists and legs loosening, but then the leaves of the corn husk took their places. Arthur could instantly feel that these plants were stronger, much stronger, and their touch burned his skin. He winced in pain as their grip tightened. Looking over the top of the stalks, he could see the plant lady's ivy retreating, the plant lady walking towards the window. She turned back. When we are gone, she said, the corn will open the drum here. They will be put out of their misery, and you will die. When the public sees how deadly your weed killer is, production will halt, and the plants can breathe easier. You, you can't do this, Arthur shouted above the sound of the winds picking up now that the ivy was retreating. The plant lady responded with a smile as the remaining ivy picked her up and gently whisked her out the window. Arthur's gaze turned to the cornstalks near the drum, who almost seemed to be grinning wickedly at him. Uh, I'm sorry, Arthur said. I, I'm sorry. It was all about the business, you know, the stockholders and all that. He knew that the corn wouldn't understand this, and his eyes focused on their leaves as they worked the latches of the 50-gallon drum. Suddenly, a rope flew into the office and made a perfect loop around the two corn stalks at the barrel. The lasso cinched tight and yanked the stalks clear of the drum. Another lasso came through the window and looped itself around the desk. Pulling tight, seconds later, the rope was used by the mighty ranch hand to enter the office. Seeing the hero, a member of the League of Good, enter the office, the five mutated corn stalks holding Arthur released their grasp and moved towards the mighty ranch hand. Arthur peeked over the top of his desk as a wild and quite surreal brawl took place in front of him. It was like an old-fashioned barroom brawl, except there was only one cowboy and he was fighting mutated stalks of corn. The mighty ranch hand's lefts and rights were strong enough to separate ears of corn from the advancing stalks. This seemed to render them unconscious and incapacitated them. He picked up the chair in front of Arthur's desk and swung it around his head, taking out stock after stock. When the last of the advancing stalks were gone, the mighty ranch hand set the chair down. Just then, Arthur heard a noise behind him. He turned, and one of the two stalks in the lasso, having dragged itself back across the room, was reaching up to open the latch on the drum. Arthur was about to shout when the mighty ranch hand's pistol fired, splitting the stalk's ear of corn cleanly in two. The stalk, a husk of its former self, fell to the ground dead. Arthur turned back around as the mighty ranch hand dusted off his hands and approached the desk. Who we, partner? the mighty ranch hand said, adjusting his hat. If that weren't the darndest thing, zombie corn stalks. You okay? Arthur stood slowly, nodding. Yes, yes, I, I, I believe I am. Thank you. You were plumb lucky that I was passing by on the flying bowl when I did. I saw the plant lady leaving this here office, and I knew she'd be up to no good. 
Well, uh, thank you, Arthur said. I, I appreciate it. Don't mention it, partner, the mighty ranch hand said, slapping him on the shoulder. All in a day's work for the League of Good. The mighty ranch hand looked down at the corn stalks lying on the ground. Hmm, I wonder what she used to mutate this corn like that. Arthur nervously looked over at the drum of Climera D, then back to the mighty ranch hand. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I know, he said softly. The mighty ranch hand shrugged. Well, if all's well now, I'll let you tend to clean it up. He began looping up his lassos, kicking them free of the now dead corn stalks. Yes, thank you, Arthur stuttered. Thank you again. The mighty ranch hand gave a big whistle, and Arthur could see the flying bull thunder up just below the window. Turning, the mighty ranch hand tipped his hat to Arthur, and then with a wild yell, hopped out the window and onto the back of the mechanical bull. Silence, save for a light wind, filled Arthur's ears. He stood quietly for a moment, computing all that had happened tonight. Then, sighing, he picked up his phone and started pushing buttons. After a moment, the line connected. Uh, Bristow, he said into the phone, it's me, Arthur. Sorry it's late, but I've decided to completely cancel the Climera D program. He listened as the other side responded. I know, I know, Arthur said. Just make sure you start the ball rolling first thing tomorrow morning. I'm not going to allow any more damage on my watch. Again, he paused. I'll tell you about it in the morning, he said. Just get on it first thing. Good night. Arthur hung up the phone and looked out the broken window over Saddle River City. Beautiful at night. You've been listening to The Cauldron of Hate. To download a PDF of the chapter you just heard, visit cauldronofhate.com. The Cauldron of Hate was written by Grant Pachoco. The story was edited by Liz Brown, and the audio was edited by Stephen Staver. Music by Dan Ring. Special thanks to all the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons who make this content possible. And a special mention to those who support at the producer level, including Dorothy Pachoco, Eve Cunning, Kathy Crawford, Tony Urbano, David Akers, Jamie Donmeyer, and Vicki Sebring. To find out more about becoming a patron, visit patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media. This episode is copyright 2021 Saturday Morning Media, Grant Pachoco Executive Producer, all rights reserved www.saturdaymorningmedia.com You've been listening to Saturday Morning Media. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.